Good morning, everybody, and you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. This is the third in a series of webinars that we've hosted over the last month or so as part of the ECT Enable Conservation Tillage Project. And what we've looked at today are some grass weed issues that different farms have encountered on, on the project. So on the previous two webinars, we've met farmers from the southeast in Wexford, and we've also met farmers from the northeast as well. And we've looked at some of the issues that they have encountered on their farms and how they've managed to deal with them over the last number of years. And likewise, today, we're going to meet farmers from the south. And I'm glad to say we have three very good farmers for you to meet this morning. And as per the previous webinars, what we will do is look at a report from each of the individual farms. And then we will have a Q&A session after each of the um, after each of the individual farms. So. At that stage, then we will ask you to get involved via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and send us in some questions. And hopefully we will be able to answer them in the allotted time that we have for you today. So like I say, we will, um, we will move on and we will try and meet those farms and we'll see how, how, what issues they've had. For any of you that have to go away or maybe miss some of today's webinar, uh, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available uh, on the Chagas Crops YouTube channel later on this morning, so you can view it back then. Uh, as as the as anybody who's um, in the industry knows, this also qualifies for IASIS points. So if you're registered on the Zoom platform, this will qualify you for IASIS points. So without further ado, we're going to meet our farmers this morning. So we have three farms for you to meet, as I say. Uh, we have Donnie McGrath, who's farming down in Tipperary. We have Bill Shanahan, who's farming over in County Waterford. But first up is Rob Coleman. And Rob is farming down in North Cork with his dad, Billy. And on the report we're going to see now, Rob talks to Michael McCarthy, our tillage advisor in County Cork, about just some of the issues that they have encountered over the last couple of years. So Rob, could you describe your current system here at the moment in terms of you know cropping and rotations and cultivation and so on and so forth? Um, Sure, Michael. Yeah, we're here in, in, in Castle Magna in North Cork, which would be a sort of a generally, you know, a dairy area. Um, we grow we grow tillage crops, we grow uh, beans, oats, barley, wheat, and um, I suppose, uh, you know, generally we're on nice kind of warm limestone ground, you know, free draining. Um, we'd have parts of the farm would be slightly stronger land and we'd have to manage those slightly different. And uh, I suppose in general, we, we're a mintill farm. We would uh, be gone from the plough with a long time now, probably 20 years ago. Um, my father Billy stopped ploughing and he just he could see that we could do better and he was kind of uh, you know prepared to take a chance and prepared to investigate the other things out there and, and persevered with it too because it's quite a steep learning curve. Um, we use a lot of organic manures again for, Dad's farming was always you know trying to get as much into the land as possible you know outside of the, the bag fertilizer and that's definitely standing to us all the time and I would say in general over time the ground has come along with the system where um, at the start it was probably more difficult to get it working and I suppose the men had to learn as well and to, to understand what was happening so it's definitely been an evolution um, to, to where we are now and I would say in a general sense you know we, we trash things out plenty we change things now and again and sort of dad was always of the opinion that you know we can take a good look at things and we won't be afraid of saying look can we do better and, and where are we going wrong and uh, I'd have a good bit of that too we, we question a lot of stuff and we'd be maybe um, you know making plenty of mistakes along the way as we try things um, but that's probably how we've got to being you know nearly all mintil and even more recently moving away from mintil into some no-till where we can and where we feel that we're confident that we can grow a decent crop without sort of taking any risks and, and sometimes even bringing benefit. Um, with the different cultivation systems do you incorporate uh, cover crops into your into your system as well? We do Michael yeah um, the cover crop is something new here with the last sort of three or four years and we're learning all the time about it um, when I joined the discussion group um, there four or five years ago, Base Ireland, we would have a huge focus on soil health. And soil health has always been the focus here with Dad. He was digging holes in the ground for years to see the soil structure, to see what kind of body you have, to see how much cultivation is needed. And if it's not necessary, don't do it. So the cover crop links into that thinking and that ethos. If you can open up the ground and if you can feed the ground with the roots of the cover crop, it's a superb start. And even if it's only you know through the rotation, it doesn't have to be every year, you can get great chances to do that instead of cultivating the ground. Instead of moving the ground, you feed the ground. Instead of just how you break it with what cultivation, the discussions are around how you build it up. Organic manures was something that I always did, but the cover crop is another element to that. That cover crop will 
do more for your organic matter in my opinion than any amount of chop straw or organic manures because it, it's feeding microbes and it, it's getting down there and it's actually every single root in the whole field is doing a small job so the the, the tons would add up in, in my opinion you know when it comes to carbon going to the ground so in a general sense when we grow winter barley we'd nearly always follow it with a cover crop because you get the best of the sunshine through the summer once it's established it grows like mad and uh, i'd be doing that sort of before my break crops so i would always have a crop of beans in the spring after a cover crop which has followed winter barley i think that's a great chance to maybe get some animals on the land if you want to graze your cover crops it's a great chance for weed suppression depending on what your target is and, and then the early sowing of the cover crop too after winter barley 100 percent. and if you want to say just you know throw in cover crops and, and as people are encouraged to do it if i got to late september or mid-september and i didn't have a cover crop in I'd be wondering about how much money I'd spend in that situation. Whereas when it's the start of August, when they go in after a winter barley, I'm getting the most growth, the biggest roots, I'm getting the most feed for my sheep if I'm putting them in there. So I suppose the cover crop in itself, as a statement, you know, it's good, but what are you trying to do and where are you trying to, 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 to go with it, you know, and what's your purpose, your objective, where in the rotation are you? I'm a huge fan of them, but I think that, you know, over time we've developed a better understanding of what we're trying to do with them. So Rob, you mentioned it's been 20 years since you made that conversion over from, from the plow based system to, to the, the start of the journey you're on now. Could you maybe tell us a bit of what you've learned along the way in regards to moving from you know the min till and the strip, strip till and then the direct till and stuff? Absolutely, Michael, yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose you said ye like it really was dead. You know, Billy started this in around the year 2000 and uh, he, he, just, he, he was always digging the land and he was having a good look. So the beginning of that was a cultivator instead of the plow. And, uh, and we started scratching the ground. The evolution was, because that was the advice from England where there was a lot less rainfall, we get 40 inches of rain here in North Cork in a normal year, we'll say. And uh, that became, I suppose, a process that, that evolved into the use of organic manures, started going deeper with the cultivator, and started seeing benefits to the, after the first couple of years, we definitely started seeing the land responding to it. So then you have to get used to the grass weed issue and stale seabeds and what you're trying to do over the summer between crops. After a crop of hybrid barley like this, you get a huge amount of volunteer growth. So dealing with that and leaving that there, um, I, I'd, I'd have, you know, we, we could talk about that for an hour in terms of what are you trying to do and how much uh, of a green bridge you want and, you know, is it is it bare land you want at all? If you're putting in a cover crop, it's different again. So um, the... The early mint till became, I suppose, deeper, and then as the land started sort of evolving, we would have probably gone to six inches, and then maybe gone to five, and then as we started broadening out the, we broadened out the rotation. That was big advance here. We started getting away from continuous cereals. We were tempted in by, you know, decent crops of straw and the hybrid barley, um, and we sort of, uh, we tried to get the beans in, you know, more often. We tried to grow first wheats only if we could, and. Uh, then with the, with the cultivation side of it, we, we, we use a, a kind of a wide spacing loosening tool, which is similar to a subsoiler, but we only use it at five or six inches at the most. And uh, in certain cases after beans, we don't use it at all. We just be straight in with the John Deere drill. Um, giving a definite answer as to what we actually do is hard because we, we size up the situations every time and Dad and I would, would, Dad and I would trash it out in the kitchen and we would try, sort of be, um, you know, always kind of just feeling our way along more than deciding at the start of the year and persevering anyway. Um, you have to allow for your grass weeds, you have to allow for your rotation, you have to allow for your soil structure, you have to allow for are you putting on organic manures or not, have you baled the straw. So within all those, you know, I suppose restrictions or whatever we want to see them, you, you, you'd feel your way forward. So, so nowadays it's mostly the disc drill, um, some no-till where the ground is ready for it, a um, lot of min-till which we're, we're evolving away from I think over time. Um, and we also find that you know the choice of variety as well. The hybrid barley definitely has a great smothering effect on grass weeds, and we'd be um, we'd be fans of, of, of that aspect of it. When when there's good ground cover, it's a great start for for grass weeds. So somewhere in the middle of all of that is is, is the is the current system. Great, great. You joined the ECT project because of grass weed issues. Could you maybe go through what are what the main issues are on the farm? You know what grass weeds are you looking at that are most problematic for you? We can do, Michael, yeah, we can have a chat about that. Um, I suppose being a member of Base Ireland, they were approached to sort of bring forward maybe a different element to the grass project, um, the grass weed project, which was the no-till. There's not that many guys doing it, and it's a very interesting part of grass weed control. So um, we have, in the min-till system that was here, you know, for years, definitely a brome problem had developed in certain parts of the farm. I would say that that brome went hand in hand with maybe too much continuous cereal that the rotation is a starting point for an awful lot of the grass weed issues in my opinion when you're trying to sort them out so um we'll say four or five 
barley's in a row and having you know no real um you know tools to tackle a brom in that situation we came down here with the project for the first time in probably november 2018 it just come out of having four or five years of continuous winter barley in the field but that we're involved here on the farm and um, you just run us through what we've done since 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 2018 you know what you've done from a grassroots management point of view uh, in the field spot on jimmy yeah um so you probably didn't see it at the end of it. Uh, it had a lot of winter barley just before that time. And while the brome was just about manageable, there was just a bit too much there to sort of say that we didn't need to do something. And uh, I think a kind of a zero tolerance policy is probably the best approach. So um, we put in a big cover crop after winter barley. And that was a very dry year. So the cover crop grew really well. We, um, we had some animals grazing it. We had some cattle and some sheep. It was a good dry part of the farm. And there was no problem. That was a dry, mild winter. And there was a lot of regrowth in the cover crop. And uh, then through the first crop of uh, spring beans, we, we tried a few different measures. We tried the time drill versus the disc drill. We tried some pure no-till. And we saw some interesting stuff where, you know, there was very little brome came initially. And then as the year progressed, maybe some spring germination um, through the, as the, the, the rain came along and as the weather changed, there was um, no chance we were going to catch it all in one year. So after the beans, we had a really good clean-up job. But what happens then when the beans ripen, you get maybe a little bit at, at the tail end coming back in the crop at the very end. So... Um, after the beans, we like to grow first wheat, and we had a super crop of first wheat, pure no-till in the, in the trials on top, and we tried some different um, approaches with uh, herbicides. So I suppose one of the striking things we found in the, the winter wheat was when we got into the springtime, again, it looked like we had good, good control of the sterile brome, and we walked the crop and we had that discussion about whether we really needed to be using that spring herbicide for brome control, but there was other broadleaf weeds and other sort of weeds there as well and we said we'd go with it but we left a couple of plots unsprayed and it was striking how much sterile brome actually emerged in the springtime and it really showed the, maybe the necessity in that season for that spring herbicide. I found that very interesting Jim, no doubt about it. Um, we were in there quite often, we were having a look. Um, this is no one simple solution fixes it. There's no perfection here. But the difference in the no disturbance versus where we'd done the cultivation, that stood out mm. to be another level again of control. Not perfection control, but we're down into small numbers, yeah. but still there just enough to maybe keep a seed population over to the next year. So I suppose, you know, if you are taking those three or four elements and if you're using them every year, over the course of time, you'll get to where you're going. But rotation being the first part of it. Absolutely. But one year won't fix it. So I think implementing a good multi sort of faceted approach to your rotation, your cultivations, your herbicides, and not just saying, oh, one thing and it's going to be fine because it isn't. Okay, so a very good insight there into, into the farm down in Cork in Rob's farm. Rob, I'm going to start with you. Um, just a quick question for you. I mean, you were probably one of the pioneers of min tail in the country uh, when, when you started back in, in whatever it was, around 2000. Why did you decide to join the ECT project? Um, sure, I suppose um, it was, yeah, dead at the time, you know, they were kind of men who were just looking forward and they were trying to sort of, you know, evolve. Um, Larry O'Reilly and uh, Jim Tracy and uh, a lot of men, you know, who would have been, you know, good sort of um, tillage men at the time, just had a good look at it. Um, and, uh, and it was trying to maybe, you know, get a bit more efficient and, and trying to maybe evolve um, which then I suppose brought its own issues with it, where the plough does, you know, send a lot of things down eight inches, 10 inches, and um, you're left to deal with these grass weeds. So we would be more familiar with them, I suppose, than plough farmers. And um, how we got involved in the ECT was, I think, you know, when the ECT was started and the funding came along, um, Tagus, you know, partnered with Base Ireland. And as a member of Base Ireland, um, myself and Gareth, and I think you had Stuart on there a couple yeah. of months back as well, spoke very well having a look at some of the more alternative means of, of, of you know, establishing your crops and um, getting away from some of the more conventional stuff. And I suppose there's um, probably fewer places in Ireland, a um, few places in Ireland to get that sort of experience of farmers having a go. We would be only three or four years in here and we're sort of, you know, learning fast, but maybe the, the mint tail experience had maybe, you know, brought us along a certain distance. So through those other farmers and base and thrashing things out, there's, there's quite a good kind of hub of them. Um, of knowledge there and that's how you know i was put forward as one of the base farmers with, with carrot to to kind of just bring maybe a, a, a different experience to the whole thing and um, maybe as, as jimmy and i would often you know sort of argue about to try and get maybe the focus away from just herbicides onto the broader picture which would be the more conventional approach the project has has the um ect you know it's, it's the conservation element of it and conservation agriculture in ireland really bases is the home of that so so we have you know we've definitely you know had good thrashings out of the different ways of doing the job and it's been it's been interesting 
Yeah, and I suppose you, you mentioned in the VT there. I mean, and and as you as you mentioned, um, uh, Garrett and 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 Stuart mentioned earlier on, your system is not just about a drill. It's about it's a system, and you mentioned cover crops. You've mentioned all different elements of it there, and I suppose that's probably something that some people tend to get fixed up, fixated on at times. You seem to be a bit more flexible. Yeah, I think, you know, to decide that that it's one thing is, is nearly impossible. What happens in, in, in the base group is that there's discussions and there's there's long discussions and there's arguments and there's kind of, oh, well, for me, this is my goal and this is true. And, and I suppose within that, then somebody learns enough about the different options available, whether it is a cover crop, whether it is, you know, maybe companion crop, whether it's, you know, the herbicides are there too, whether it's the no-till or maybe, you know, pure no-till versus maybe a, a kind of revised version of it guys are finding their way along as to what works, what works easily, what works over time, where you kind of find out the challenges, maybe learn from other people's experiences, so that you, you do come up with maybe an evolved farming system, which um, I, I guess, you know, it, it gives you more hope and more encouragement that you actually might be able to grow a better crop with lower inputs, and uh, you actually might get on top of your, uh, of your problems. An awful lot of the philosophy is that you're taking responsibility for your own stuff. As uh, Jimmy and Michael and I have been discussing, you know, down here a bit, that if you're if you're looking at a problem on your farm and saying, well, where is the, the chemical company going to come along and come up with a solution for me? This is kind of more of a personal thing where, right, uh, the grass weeds in our farm here, Shay, you know, myself and Billy, they're of our own causing, really, you know, our rotations and our different things as we've been going along. We, we probably, you know, set the seeds literally and metaphorically of our own issues. And now, you know, trying to start to say, okay, where is this being won and lost? Um, the rotation generally tends to be the, the beginning of it, but the beginning of all the, the, the various tools that we do use. Yeah, and I noticed you actually when you were saying it there, you mentioned rotation, but you also mentioned cover crops and catch crops. And you were kind of, you were, what I say, late to the kind of the cover crops debate. I mean, you were sort of, you're three or four years growing cover crops now at this stage. What made you change your mind? And, and are you seeing the benefits of that system already, do you think? I suppose, like yourselves and Tagus, we were fairly late comers to the to the cover crop thing, and um, we we have seen it fit in a nice little niche for for our own soil health benefits. We've we've been pushing soil health here in our own way, very much organic manures in the mint till. But now, you know, having joined base and having had a look at the other options, there's five or six or seven different things. Now, they're not all for me. Some of the mm. guys are into brewing biology and stuff like that, and that's just a bit beyond me just at the moment. But in time, once I start understanding it, I start looking towards it. Um, Garrett likes the companion cropping. And again, it's something I can see great potential in. But just for now, we would be kind of, um, I suppose, taking the bits that we feel fit for us. We're, we're in a great area here for uh, for straw. So, so, you know, the winter barley does well for us. And that opens up a great opportunity, like I was seeing in the video, for the cover crop. Um, we wouldn't be sort of sticking them in all over the place any chance we get. Some of the guys do that. And it's something that, um, you know, we, we would be kind of... Um, just saying that the really good spot for the really good cover crop is where I like to use it. And, and beyond that, then, um, you know, my system allows me to sort of, you know, maybe have a bit of flexibility around it, but I can see huge benefit to it. And, and the guys that are doing it longer than me are, are seeing even more benefit the longer they're in the system. Because the problem with my rotation here is that I might get a cover crop in one year in three after each winter barley in my kind of a six year rotation. Um, and if you wanted to make more progress quicker, you might maybe bring in more spring cropping and, and go um, go into more cover crops. The challenge all the time, Shay, is, is trying to get this in a system where we can still make money. Winter crops are our bread and butter here. We have a margin that we need. It's a small, it's a low margin business. And, you know, tillage farmers are, are pressed by so many other things. So saying, lads, the environment is important and let's, you know, let's all save the environment. It needs to make money first and foremost. So that's the fine line, which, you know, a lot of the discussion group in, in base is about trying to maintain margin and, and change things carefully and, and just, you know, understand what you're doing. So it's, it's an awful lot of information and it's, it's learning 24-7. I think you've mentioned several times, uh, Rob, and I couldn't agree with you more. The fact you're in a discussion group, you happen to be in base, is a great way of sharing information, sharing ideas and, and learning from one another. I think there's great learning from farmers in, in that scenario. Quick question here from Tim, and I know, having discussed earlier on, you have sterile brome as an issue on the farm, but you also have Italian ryegrass. How have you managed to get over those problems in the last couple of years? Yeah, that's the sort of number of it for a lot of people, Shea, and um, it's a good question. We have, uh, we used to talk about brome an awful lot through the mintil days, you know, brome was at the forefront of most discussions. And genuinely, I suppose, as I alluded to in the video, we were getting sort of greedy on our rotation in terms of, we, we liked sort of certain land that suited wheat, so we'd grow wheat there. And of course, you know, herbicides are great, 
but the more you use them, you know, the less effective they are. The more you rely on something, you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket. So um, that has been the kind of evolution of some of our issues with the brome. And as we brought in the beans regularly around the farm and maybe beans, we'll say a first wheat and second barley, and then maybe another spring crop, or even you could maybe change that second barley in, into a spring barley as well, just so that if you cure your problem, in the short term, you'll benefit from the long term. So, so trying to take a longer term view on the grass weed issues has been of benefit. The ryegrass you mentioned, um, I suppose the focus of the farming year has been on brome and we've kind of, you know, delved into that and sorted that to a point and it, it's kind of very much, you know, not really discussed anymore and we feel that it's not going to become a problem and, um, you know, that much in the next couple of years. The, the ryegrass hasn't had the same focus. So we would have a touch of resistance in some of our ryegrass because it's been sort of treated with the same chemicals all along. Um, bringing the, the beans into and we've gone away from oilseed rape as well so maybe that's maybe something we continuously have a look at tempted back in but the um, bringing the, the beans consistently into ground and maybe where that gets challenging is if you blend that maybe slightly stronger trying to get the beans in in the month of March is, is a challenge and trying to get them cut in time yeah, and right, eaten yeah. afterwards yeah. so so there would be land there that, that that would maybe be slightly more challenging when it comes to bringing in the break crop that's going to you know, help to, to mitigate the problem. But it's also the land that stands to benefit the most from a cover crop, benefit the most from the beans, because it'll open up that land. So it's, it, I'm afraid it's not a simple answer for you there. No, there's, there's, sure. there's, a lot, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that have to be done, I suppose, to get on top of them. Uh, listen, Rob, we'll, we'll come back to you later on. I just want to get, bring in some of the other guys as well. You mentioned there the Italian and the sterile. Jimmy, just from your perspective in terms of not just Rob's farm, but do you think a sterile brome or, or Italian are to become more of a problem? And would you be, would you, would you be more concerned about around the country? Um, I'd say style brome, I'd say, is probably nearly on every farm now at this stage. And, and to fair to Rob, bar that one field where they might have had a bit of continuous winter barley, it seems to be well under control. And, and once you bring back into rotation and he does the other few culture control measures, like it's, it's, I would say it's well under control now. I'd probably be a bit, a bit more concerned about the Italian ryegrass at this stage. While it's relatively uncommon where it is, it seems to be coming increasingly challenging to control and a lot of that is probably down to the fact that it can produce so much seed like you could be looking at one plant producing 5,000 seeds so very very quickly it can it can become a challenge where you know maybe you don't focus on it or maybe it just slips slips through in one season and all of a sudden you have a big problem and on top of that now we're starting to see a bit of herbicide resistance evolving as well and um, in cases I, I'm just doing a little bit of research on it like they've there's well over 500 cases of resistance now in the UK from Italian ryegrass um, and non-target site resistance seems to be more problematic than target site, which means it's more resistant to more herbicides rather than being specifically resistant to one group of herbicides. On top of that as well as something else which I found is very worrying, the first um, confirmed resistant, uh, glyphosate resistant plant in Europe was ryegrass. So from that point of view, it's something that's relatively uncommon becoming a bigger challenge where it is. And I think people should be really, really just keep an eye out and be very vigilant and, uh, you know, make sure that um, if you do see it, just just, just, just uh, prevent seed return, do that bit of rogue and whatever you need to do, because I think potentially it could be a big issue. And I think you've mentioned there several times, um, uh, Jimmy, about the resistance. I suppose the one thing farmers generally tend to always kind of ask is when is the next new chemical coming out or herbicide coming out that's going to solve this problem for us? Um, is there anything new in the pipeline do you think or can we rely on new herbicides to control these problems for us no I don't think we can rely on them like there, there probably is new herbicides coming along in the pipeline they're, they're very slow to come through but like even the chemical companies themselves now would say like the, the answer is not in a can the answer is in your culture control so you need to be looking at everything you can do as Rob has talked about you need to be looking at all those cultural options rotation is absolutely vital looking at that brought those um those break crops whether it be icy rape or beans moving the spring crop and those type of things and and the other things you can do in the meantime as well um that's what we need to be focusing on because they will have and and it's it's not just one culture control option in one season it's a number of options over the course of rotation that's going to be the answer chemicals will help and they will help to give you a, a level of control that's needed but they're not the answer yeah, and I suppose that brings me nicely to Vija. Vija, uh, Vija Bashar, who most people were probably familiar with now, Vija is doing a lot of the resistance testing in Park. Vija, what are you seeing in terms of resistant populations out there? I mean, you've, you've tested some of Rob's, you've, but you've tested others around the country as well? 
yeah uh, for, for example like rops uh, italian dry grass uh, is multiple resistance so when we tested it with the ask uh, herbicide like axial uh, pulcan or status ultra it was uh, uh, it was resistant to uh, axial and uh, pulcan but not to status ultra so rops still got uh, uh, an herbicide option to give a complete control whereas uh, when we tested with the als uh, pacifica plus or uh, broadway star or monolith it was completely uh, resistant so uh, so uh, uh, to your question uh, so far we have tested uh, like a uh, f- uh, like four population of italian dry grass and all the four population uh, uh, were uh, carrying uh, resistant to als uh, herbicide like pacifica broadway star or monolith and even some population were uh, resistant to uh, axial or falcon or uh, uh, status ultra from uh, uh, from uh, uh, ack's group and uh, when it comes to wild dots we have tested around uh, 100 plus population about 10 persons were uh, 10% were resistant and uh, all the all the population all the field population uh, were resistant to uh, ack herbicides again like axial uh, falcon or status ultra so there is no evidence of uh, als resistance when it comes to uh, 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 wild dots i, I mean uh, there is no resistance to pacifica plus or broadway star products and uh, again uh, when we have tested like black grass uh, and the situation is quite complex uh, with black grass because we have the we are uh, we have the our own native population and we have the which is evolving resistant and uh, we have the we have the imports from the uk which is already resistant so so far we have tested like uh, 18 population a little over 50% were resistant and 25 27% were resistant to uh, multiple uh, herbicide so and these population uh, black grass especially when we tested with the glyphosate uh, we found that uh, uh, a significantly higher rate uh, than the recommended field rate needed to control uh, such a multiple resistant population so it's very okay. worrying uh, at the moment yeah yes yeah, it is worrying vijay yeah, i'm sorry i'm just going to move on quickly to michael because i'm running out of time on this yeah. this section michael you see much grass weed issue starting to appear in cork or is it an ongoing problem it's an ongoing problem sir um I suppose traditionally Cork would have, you know, the rotation would have revolved around sugar beet. And after the demise of the sugar beet industry, we would have seen an awful lot more continuous winter cereal, especially continuous winter barley. And that's when you see the likes of your sterile broom and stuff coming forward. But it's not just sterile broom we're looking at. We we, we do have significant problems with canary grass, uh, wild oats. And as of late, we have problems with black grass as well. So we have all of them here in Corkshire. It's, a, it's um, an evolving situation. Michael. It is. It yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, it is. Listen, guys, I'm sorry now. We're just going to have a cut it there because we're running over time already. Uh, all the guys will be back later on for the panel at the very end. So but for now, thanks, guys. And we're going to move on to our second video today, which is is from Bill Shanahan down in, in, in County Waterford. So Bill is going to talk us through his, his the issues he's seeing down there in County Waterford. So we're here in Kilmac Thomas in County Waterford with Bill Shanahan and we're just going to discuss his experiences on the ECT project. So Bill, can you give us a brief overview of your farming system here, the location, soil type and maybe your cropping pattern? Well, you're welcome to Kilmac Thomas anyway, Elaine. Uh, we're, we farm, we have dairy herd here and we grow some wheat, barley, oats, uh, the tillage and the things we've about 60% of our ground I suppose and um, uh, we would be uh, farming here in the view of the mountains which has nice mild impact on our climate but also high levels of rainfall and stuff about 1200 1250 mils per year which and can be more sometimes and less other times of course. Um, this crop here is spring barley, growing for distilling in Waterford Distillery, and it's a variety called tungsten. All free draining, uh, lightish, light to medium, I suppose. This particular stuff here actually is Clonroach series soil, <coughs> believe it or not, and um, all easy work. Uh, well, we have grown maize, beet, and so on, but at the moment it's all cereals, yes. Yeah. So why did you change from a plough system then to a mintel system? We would still use the plough in conditions where we had to, but it would be a very small percentage of it. Uh, we changed to uh, a machine that has discs and cultivating legs there about six or seven years ago, I suppose. And in the main, it works very well. Uh, but as I say, sometimes we might have to revert to the plough in wet conditions and so on like that. 
we were anxious i suppose to start improving the soil you know try and keep as much um uh, organic matter in the top few inches but we also would apply uh, in our dairy we we you everything is connected let's say the straw goes for the bedding and barley goes for feeding and stuff like that okay so and then it completes the circle the dung comes back onto the stubbles and we would also spread some chicken dung and stuff like that uh, which we would plow in but m most of the organic fertilizer we would try to mix it in the top few inches of the soil and it's very good for fertility and building organic matter and so on and the worm count and all of that yeah so what's the main grass weed challenge on your farm then Bill? Um, <coughs> the most worrying would be a bit of black grass that we have here in this crop here. Um, we would also have a pieces of uh, sterile brome around the headlands which was even there in the plough times but uh, we would be more aware of it now since we joined up with the Tagish uh, grass weed group we're much more aware of grass weeds in, in particular now before back the years we used to have a lot of annual meadow grass and we would find actually with the non-plowing that the annual meadow grass is decreasing and so are broadleafed weeds but uh, we would have to keep a big eye on the black grass and the sterile brome in particular those two when did you first notice the black grass issue bill and how did you identify it <sighs> nearly 10 years ago um, but we only got it properly identified there six years, five or six years ago, thereabouts, yeah. So Bill has two fields involved in the project on the farm. This field I'm standing in here now is about six acres and this is where the main problem with the black grass is. He also has about a 20 acre field the other side of this where the black grass is slightly encroached into just on the other side of the ditch and at the back of the yard. So when we got here in 2018 Bill had already put in a spring crop, or was planning on putting in spring crops here because uh, the black grass had been identified the previous year by the, the specialists down in this region, Kieran Collins. So we um, initially we had the, we had the we had the black grass tested just to find out what the resistance profile of, of it was, and we found that it's resistant to both ALS and ACCA. So more or less, he's very very limited in what chemistry he can use here. The likes of Pacifica and Broadway Star, Monolith, and these things won't control it, and neither will falcon stratus ultra or axil for instance axil pro for instance so given those limitations spring cropping is his, is his only real options here at the moment uh, so what you'll find we came in here in the spring of 2019 after the, the crop of spring barley was sown and you can see there was a fairly significant level of black grass in the in the in the field looking at maybe 60 plants per meter squared in parts of it and plus which it would if you think of black grass only 20 percent of it will emerge in the springtime so you can imagine what would have happened what would have germinated in the autumn time uh, so initial counts in the springtime showed a fairly significant amount of black grass in it. So we just went spring cropping in the first year. There was a slight reduction, but numbers were still high enough to be concerned about it. So the following year we went back in with spring cropping again. Uh, spring barley was the option, but we increased our sowing rates by 20%. So that was back in 2020, and you could see there was starting to we were starting to see a reduction in the level of black grass in the field. We've gone back in again this season. Uh, spring barley again. 20% higher seeding rate and um, why we're, we haven't quite got to the stage where we can do a head count to see what level of black grass is in the field. Spring count indications will be that we're seeing the gradual reduction of the level of black grass that's emerging in these crops. Um, the reason we're going with spring cropping, spring cropping has proven to be very, very uh, reliable and valuable in reducing the level of black grass uh, that are in fields. You can see with these plants here, uh, these are emerged in the spring barley. You can see how how slender they are, how much, how little they have tillered as well. So the the, 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 the competitive uh, nature of the spring barley means you're going to have less tillers, you're going to have less heads, and you're going to have less seeds um, being produced as well. So the cultural control options that Bill has been utilising on his farm since his involvement in the ECT project have consisted of using stale seed beds in the autumn, try and get a good germination on the black grass plants that are there, and then using uh, spring cropping, predominantly spring barley, due to its competitive nature and increasing the seeding rates. So going forward, what we're probably going to do in this field, because of our, the limited option of uh, break crops we have, because of the, the different the resistance profile of the black rush, we're probably going to stick with spring cropping and spring barley in this field for the next couple of years. It does seem to be doing the job and reducing 
the level of black grass we have. Winterized rape is something we can consider once we feel that we have reduced the black grass sufficiently and we do have herbicide options in that with the, with the likes of Astro Curb. So you've been part of the ECT project now for about three years, Bill. What are the, I suppose, the main benefits that you've seen being part of the project or the impacts that it's made on your management strategies for grass weeds? It has increased our awareness of problem grass weeds and also how to limit their damage and maybe try to eradicate them. Uh, just giving us a greater understanding of stuff, to be honest, uh, Elaine. And um, yeah, I've great, it's been a great help so far. Taking into account the benefits then, Bill, going forward and um, having been part of the project, what do you see your management strategies changing um, for, for future? The real one we're worried about is the black grass. I don't really see a problem with sterile brome if you have spring cropping and stuff like that, you know. Uh, it's not as much of an issue, I find. But the black grass is the biggest worry. So in this instance here, we'll be keeping this crop in spring barley and we also do as much uh, uh, stubble cultivation and uh, you know destroying the green shoots and stuff that come up so we're, we're just using that we're not using well we have tried a couple of chemicals here uh, with you know varied response really but we're relying on cultural and cropping spring cropping to try and overcome the problem so the key points I think that we should take from what we've learned on Bill's farm are the, the, the importance of early identification. So as Bill said, the, the black grass has probably been on the farm for the bones of 10 years. It took five to six years to really understand it and, and actually get it fully identified. At that point, winter cropping here was really unviable. So it just shows the, the value of getting uh, a weed if you spot something you're not familiar with, get it identified early. Uh, finding out if it is resistant is very important as well. Understand the resistance profile because then you can put your management strategy in place. Uh, the value of the cultural control, spring cropping is really working here, increasing seeding rates. So the value of the cultural controls and, and how they're going to um, bring down the level of black grass in the field. I think the other thing is important to mention is uh, it's a credit to Bill and to his son James that farm here that black grass hasn't spread from this field and into the next field and further beyond into the farm. So that's a aging was up to scratch and it prevented that from becoming uh, a problem on the rest of the farm. Okay, again, very interesting insight into into Bill's farm there. So I'm just going to ask in the guys here again to, co to come in on, on, the, on the session. Bill, I'm going to start with you first. I mean, you mentioned there probably black grass is the one that stands out for, for most people there who are watching today. You saw it about 10 years ago. How long did it take, do you think, that you decide this is a problem? We were, we were plowing and we were trying, you know, we... Um, uh, the, we were concerned that we weren't getting on top of it with Roundup and winter wheat uh, type of chemicals, you know, the, the normal wheat control with the winter wheat. And um, we knew we had some issue that wasn't, we weren't getting the better of their shea. So uh, as I say, during a group meeting, uh, Kieran uh, identified it positively. So we knew we, we knew we had to act uh, in a more serious fashion. <clears throat> and do you mind a bit of, uh, if I'm asking then, when, when you found out it was black grass, I mean, what was the thought process then? Is this kind of, oh God, I'm in trouble here? Or I know we've talked to some people around the country who kind of try to deny it and all that sort of carry on. How did you address the issue then when you did realise that you had this, this dreaded black grass on the farm? Well, we... The day that we that Kieran had a look at it, uh, we went back and we sprayed it immediately with a full rate of Pacifica, and it only discoloured it for a short while, and then it continued to grow. So look, uh, it was quite obvious then that winter series at that stage uh, of any type were out of the question. So we went immediately to spring corn, you know. Yeah, and I suppose that's it's it's understanding the the weed is is part of the issue. Then knowing when it, when it germinates, and as as we've seen from the VT, you've you've pretty much switched away. Even though you have a, a lucrative straw market, you've pretty much switched that field away from winter cereals altogether now. Oh yeah, yeah, we haven't had any winter cereal there, and I don't I don't see there being any winter cereal being in it for in the foreseeable future anyway. You know. Yeah, and I suppose one of the questions that people will ask and. 
I know we were talking earlier on about it before the webinar. Would you consider um, putting it into grass or is that something you've considered yet? <clears throat> if we fail in the long term to overcome the weed, we will put it into grass. But uh, they're nice, nice ground, to be honest with you. And we like to be growing barley there and the barley is for distilling and local and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's ground that suits spring barley as well. Let's say and we have good rainfall and, you know, it's microclimate. So we don't normally suffer droughts or, or bad weather. So look, uh, the margin from the spring barley for the distilling would be reasonably good, you know. So, you, yeah, so the plan is to stick with it for the moment. On, it, it is. If at all possible. Jimmy, I might come in to you there on that then. In terms of that, have you seen, since this, since you started with working with Bill, have you seen a reduction in the level of, of black grass in the field that the, the project is in? Yeah, we have. Um, we're looking at, I suppose, Bill, the first spring crop, I think, went in there in 2018. So we had a spring crop in 2019 and with spring crop again now 2020. So in... We have we've definitely seen a fifty just just over a fifty percent reduction, um, in the first couple of years in the level of spring or in the level of black grass that was germinating in the springtime. Now, uh, we did a head count last year as well, but between the storms and everything else, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be confident in the data that was there. So, we did go out and we did another um spring count after about four weeks after crop was sown just this April gone, and we saw another considerable reduction I'd say maybe close to 75% of a reduction compared to where we were the first year now I think this year given the year we've seen and the level of grass weeds I've seen emerging late in both winter and spring crops now I think the head count in a couple of weeks time will probably give us a better a better picture of exa exactly the level of control we have received we've achieved to date was definitely going in the right way like if you look at what the research in the UK is telling us spring crop and you could get up to anywhere up to 80 to 90 percent of reduction in a couple of years going switching to spring crop and so i think we're on the right track and we're definitely seeing an improvement in the in the levels of black grass that are in the field and a quick question in here from bobby what seed rates are you suggesting that guys use for spring barley to try and get on top of this to smother it out well i would be suggest i'd be increase your seed rates by 20 percent. bill i think you were going with um what was your seeding rate you used there in the field in the last year? Well, in, in, in old style figures, 14 stone an acre. Yeah, that's yeah, including the 20% increase. Exactly, yeah. 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 Not less than 14 stone. Yeah, and Bill, I mean, you're stopping it from, I presume you're stopping it from spreading to other fields in the farm. How are you managing to stop it from spreading <coughs> to the other fields? I presume you're cleaning combines and hygiene has become paramount. We do. But that is, we do, we clean down the combine and open it out and blow it out and scrape off all of the chaff and stuff like that, which, you know, can take quite a while to do it. But the trouble is, though, it, that's where I see a weak point, you know, you might not get every seed and well, you won't get every seed and stuff. So there's great potential for spreading from an infected field or infested field to clean ground in spite of your best intentions. And the greatest danger then is, you know, we know we have a problem, so we're trying to deal with it. But if you were cutting in a place where you didn't see the issue and you were going to other fields there, you know, the potential for this weed to spread throughout the country is very real indeed. Yeah, and I think you're taking a, a kind of zero tolerance approach to any other fields that you harvest after that and you're inspecting it, I think you were saying, for to see is there any, uh, any plants coming through. Oh, we would. Uh, we've noticed in uh, two or three fields now where the, which have been cut following those ones, just inside the gap where you'd restart the combine again, there is evidence of it uh, of uh, a couple of plants. But luckily, they're only you know uh, very small uh, infestations, and you can easily pull out those uh, uh, those uh, weeds, let's say, and uh, deal with it. But you know, we're looking for it. You see, so if you're not looking for it. That's the greatest thing, danger, yeah. you know. And you have it down to rogable levels in those other fields, so you. you well, in those fields, but yeah. in the in the original field, it's certainly not rogable, no. Yeah, yeah. V, thanks, Bill. Vijay, just coming quick to you again. Mm. You've tested a lot of black grass populations around the country. Are you seeing many multiple resistance black grass species across the country? Uh, yes, we we have uh, <clears throat> we have around uh, five population that uh, that, that shows uh, resistance uh, to all the black grass. Uh, herbicide like uh, falcon or status ultra as well as uh, pacific or monolith but some population uh, were, uh, were resistant only to aces 
but i mean uh, to uh, to falcon or status ultra but not to pacifica plus or monolith so uh, yeah so it's a, it's, a, it's the situation is quite complex and that it needs uh, that we need to test across a different herbicide uh, types to find uh, the right uh, uh, you know the right uh, herbicide to recommend for example if you take a bills uh, uh black grass population it was resistant to all the herbicide even to uh, glyphosate as well i won't say it as resistant but uh, but was showing a degree of tolerance and uh, it was required around uh, 3 liters per hectare which is uh, two times the recommended uh, label rate of uh, standard uh, glyphosate product uh, was required to control uh, uh, bilshanan population in field in a controlled uh, condition Okay, listen, guys, listen, thanks for that. We could stay talking about this for, for a few minutes, mm -hmm. but listen, in the interest of time, we move on to the next video and we can answer any other questions that are coming in at the session at the end. So listen, we move on to the next session here where Donny McGrath is talking to Connor Kavanagh in, in Tipperary about the situation on Donny's farm. We're here on the farm of Donny McGrath, close to Clonmel in South Tipperary, and we're going to hear about his experiences with the ECT project to date. Okay, so Don Lam, could we just get a brief overview of the farming system here on the farm, the location and the soil type and the rotation on the farm at present? Right, I suppose basically it's a one-man show here, working the home farm, and the emphasis is on making money as much money as possible without too much reinvestment and we do make a big effort to market the straw outside this area um, we're basically on a nice type of soil um, our weather isn't too bad we get a bit of moisture every harvest every day during the harvest out in that gap in the morning time we're tending towards continuous cereals because of the straw and I'm afraid of beans from the moisture point of view but we are running into problems with grasses it doesn't help the grass control situation we're trying to depend on pig slurry of which we've got a very good reliable source and we spread it ourselves via dribble bar and uh, I have to say we find it good uh, we're watching our P's and K's all the time and we're able to um, keep up the levels we're at three and four everywhere and uh, this is our first year not using any last year we were advised not to use any but we hadn't the courage to do it but I'm confident into the future that we'll use less and less we'll be using less p if any and we might have to top up k but there is a definite there seems to be more of a benefit than just the financial part of it it does something to the soil apart from giving it fertility i feel anyway yeah. and just follow on from that uh would you give a brief overview of the crop establishment system here on the farm i mean the type the type of uh, system in place on the farm and when was the system put in place Sure, we have been min tilling for 20 years at this stage. We've used a tine cultivator and a harsh drill all the time. Not the tidiest in appearance, but it always gets you through. I also have a new carrier cross cutter disc. And whereas it is a very nice machine for the stale seed bed technique because you keep all your problems up on top. I'd be worried that you could run into uh, capping problems or little pans just two inches down. So, And uh, could we also get an overview of the grass weed challenge on the farm? When the grass weed challenge was first identified and the main grass weeds that are causing problem on the farm? We have every challenge on the farm. <laughs> uh, we started off with broom at least 25 years ago and it came in from grass cuttings thrown over the wall and we were roguing by hand when we were ploughing and then we went min tilling and the the broom has to be it has to be said that it exploded but we got in control of that and a fair share of it would be down to my fault not doing things timely enough or not doing the right thing but we know more now uh, but as we go forward the present challenge is ryegrass and 
I think, I, I know what I'm going to do, whether it's the right thing or not, we'll, time will tell. But if we're successful in the rye grass, the broom should be sorted as well. It's a combination of rotation of, of spring and winter and also it looks like rotation now of other crops and I see rape looks pretty promising at the minute. So, so uh, the main grass we challenged that Donny has that Donny had coming into the project was sterile brome. This field that we're in, which which is the project field, had a, a significant brome challenge as well as a ryegrass challenge at the time. Um, before we sort of got down here, there was a small trial done on winter barley, uh, comparing a conventional two row with a six row hybrid to see. Was there any difference in the, the in a, I suppose from a suppression point of view and a reduction in um, in the seed return uh, with the hybrid? Unfortunately, it was probably a little bit too early. The level of brome in the field just didn't lend itself to it, and it was far too competitive for both of the crops at the time. Um, since then, so what we've done with in this field is we've, we've switched to spring barley uh, to try some spring cropping. Uh, what I should say is the, the, in the harvest of 2019, coming up to that harvest, we actually found black grass in a middle section of the field. Um, we sort of decided a zero tolerance approach was the best thing to do here and we decided just to plough that section where we had found the, found the black grass at the time. So it was um, myself and, uh, and David Schiller, who's a technician on the project, we walked each of the tram lines and, and it was rogue thoroughly. Uh, to ensure we didn't get any seed return, we then advised only just to plough that section, just from a just a zero tolerance point of view. We didn't want this uh, continuing and growing in the, pre, in the in the subsequent crop, subsequent crop. So we've gone to spring cropping in this field now because both both um, black grass, uh, sterile brome, and rye grass are predominantly autumn germinating weeds. Uh, so what we found in the last two seasons with the spring cropping is we have seen a reduction uh, in the level of brome. And ryegrass in the field. Um, partly of that, I'd say, will be down to the plough base, uh, the ploughed section as well, where he buried what what seeds have been on the soil surface at the time. Um, what we did then is, given the success of that part, we actually moved and we ploughed a second section of the field where there was high levels of brome and ryegrass, and we're seeing the same uh, the same result. We're seeing a vastly reduced level of brome and ryegrass coming into crop. Um, it's not an ideal situation, but sometimes. It just you just have to hit the reset button. Um, trying to control very very high levels of some of these um, some of these autumn germinating grass weeds in winter uh, in mintail systems in winter crops is extremely challenging and extremely costly. And sometimes you just it's not ideal, but sometimes you just have to put the plow in just to reset the button. Um, going forward from here. Um, I think rotation is going to be key. We are spring cropping. Uh, Donny is going to start sowing some bray crops and put them into rotation as well, which is going to vastly improve the situation on the farm. Um, since we've been involved in the project, we've also identified resistant ryegrass on the farm, which is going to present another challenge. So again, this is where the bray crops are going to come in. Um, it's resistant to the ALS chemistry. So from uh, you know the likes of winter wheat and things like that, it's going to become increasingly difficult to control that in the springtime with your, with your ALS herbicide. So rotation is going to be a key factor going forward in, in the control of grass weeds on the farm. The other culture and control option that Donny is using here at the moment in conjunction with the spring cropping is, is the stale seabed. So he's trying to get in a number of stale seabeds where he can. I suppose the key thing about the stale seabed here is he's, he's cultivating at the right time, he's cultivating to the right depth. So he's keeping it shallow to five centimeters absolute max till in depth and he's getting in as soon as the straw is off the ground he's getting in and doing that cultivation so that he's he's so that the and the reason for that is that sterile brome needs that bit of darkness and soil contact in order to germinate whereas if you leave it on the soil surface it tends to go dormant and you end up having it in the following crop since joining the ect project what have you seen the benefits and what changes have you put in place on the farm over the last number of years well, it's good to meet people who are specialists in this line and to get to meet them and onto your farm. And they make you aware of the new products there. They make you aware of other experiences. And um, it helps me to do things a little bit better and I'm being encouraged towards uh, rotation, which I think they're right because we have to go that way anyway. So I'd say just doing things better, basically.
when you know these fellas are coming around you're going to try anyway <laughs> okay and finally how do you see the future control strategies for grass weeds on your farm i suppose in the real bad situations you have to think culturally first and what springs to mind is definitely spring crops and spring barley is the one that's there but also uh, there's spring oil seed rape because you can leave it that little bit later and get another flush perhaps you know and it appears that we cannot rely on on the chemicals but sure we'll be watching for new ones and not putting the existing ones under too much pressure but you have to get out the cultivator you have to go into spring crops and rotation crops as well you know break crops so it's a combination of all those and maybe start off from the point of view of getting rid of broom rather than trying to grow wheat so i suppose the key points we we've seen here on in the few years we're down here on donny's farm is um these autumn germinating grass weeds were an increasing problem in uh, continuous cereal rotation in a mintil in a mintil situation so we went to wheat we went to barley and winter oats we were probably a little bit too reliant on herbicides down here didn't have enough culture controls in the mix so now we're starting to see where the culture controls are really playing the, paying dividends we're using stale seabeds and spring cropping and you can see the reduction in the level of grass weeds within this field we asked we also had to do a bit of plowing but i think that was mainly because the main reason for that was because we had identified black grass and we took a zero tolerance approach to it so we can learn a lot from Doyne's experiences over the years. He's been min tilling for almost 20 years. In those 20 years, he's had a continuous cereal rotation. And in the last few years, you can just see the grass weed challenges could be coming worse and worse and worse. Go, and, and he's probably had an over-reliance on herbicides. Um, going forward, cultural controls and particularly rotation is going to be key to getting on top of the grass weed challenge on the farm. Okay, again, uh, thanks to, to Jimmy, to, to Connor, and to Donny there. Very interesting um, case study again. Um, while I'm waiting for Donny to come in, Jimmy, just a quick question for you there. You mentioned ploughing there, and I suppose when you're trying to deal with certain grass weeds, particularly the likes of black grass, some people are kind of encouraging that guys leave them on the soil surface and, and stale seabed like Donny's doing. Why did you decide to plough in, in that circumstance? Um, I suppose we, we just, it was, um, I suppose, given the, the pressure that we had in grass weeds in the field in general, the fact that we come across black grass and the fact that it was identified, it was the first time it was seen in the field. It hadn't been there in a previous crop. You know, we took a zero tolerance approach, put it down, put it down to a depth where it's not going to germinate and leave it down. So that is down now and it hasn't come back. Up. We've been in the crop in the last two seasons since that and the black grass hasn't re-emerged. And how, now, long do you, how long do you think it will stay down there? How long do you think, how long will it be before it, it's got completely gone, do you think? Uh, black grass, you'll see a decline in the, in the, in the seeds. Or black grass seeds will naturally decline in the seed bank, uh, maybe 70 to 80% of a decline year on year. Now, it's a, it's a 78% of a large population, so it takes a long time. Like if we were putting, if someone was putting a field down to grass, where they had a black grass situation, you'd be looking at five years minimum to try and ensure that the level of black, uh, level of the grass weed that was going to come back up had been reduced significantly. And I suppose I would say, like ploughing at that stage was, it, it was really just, it was it was a zero tonnes approach. It's not something I would go out and tell everybody they need to go ploughing to solve their, their grass weed issues because cultivation, one single cultivation system is not the answer here. It's all, it's rotation. It's looking at your sown out. It's sown the right crop at the right time in the right slot and combining all those different cultural controls. Like there's too much of this or you should be playing, or you should be Milton. It's it's him against us. It's not. It's, it's it's everybody has a role to play. And as Rob mentioned, it's about what's happening on your farm. There's no one situation that you know. It's no one glove that's going to suit all here. Like everybody has to look at what they're doing on their own farm. They have to take into cultural control options that are going to work for them. And yes, cultivation. Everybody has to get a crop established. But there's there should be no. Oh, you should be playing, or you shouldn't be playing, or you should be cutting Milton, or you should be direct drilling you have to find what suits your own farm and what's going to work for you. And I think we need to get it, move away from that. You know, it's, there's too much emphasis on, on plowing or min tilling. It's, it's all those cultural control options and rotation. And I think it's a team that's ran through all of these ECT webinars. Rotation is absolutely vital. Yeah. And just moving on to Donny with that, uh, Jimmy, 
Donny, you mentioned there that steroid brome really became a problem when you when you moved over to Mintel. Do you do you attribute that to the continuous serials or to the system? Do you think? The system and lack of awareness at the time. Uh, we were told that uh, sterile broom only lasted one year. It doesn't last. It takes a couple of years. It stays. It germinates throughout the winter. It germinates, if you ask me, it germinates from the 1st of September right through to May. We were told at the time that it only germinates in the autumn. You get your flush. That would do it. But no, it's a continuous thing. It's temperature related. And am I right in saying, Donny, you're, you're doing a lot of stale seed beds now to try and, and get on top of that. And how is that working for you? And how many are you doing in the season or can you do in the season, do you think? That's, that's the hub of the whole thing, isn't it? Um, the window is so narrow. That, that's why the spring crops work so well. The only winter crop that I'm enthusiastic about is winter wheat because we have the the Pacificas, we have the, the chemicals to some extent. We've got no chemical on winter barley. I wish I could grow winter barley, but I can't because uh, I haven't got the, the window for stales. Sorry, because I have too, I have no broom control. Yeah. But take, take last year, for instance, we were sowing on the 24th, 25th of September and we had frost every night. So yeah. we're waiting till the 11th, or sorry, till 11 o'clock in the daytime. And then compact, compound that with spreading slurry and trying to get a stale seed bed. We tend to get two flushes. Okay. We'd, be, we'd get a flush. You'd have a flush there about the 10th of September. And you'd, you'd burn it off with Roundup. And then you'd come again roughly 10 days later. There'd be another bit there and you hit it with Roundup again. And you sow. So we would um, sow so at the 20th of October, but... Even though our land is dry, it doesn't seem to take moisture. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's that, you're getting risky at that stage then in the year too to get everything. Very risky. Going. Yeah. And in terms of the, the overall problem now, have you managed to reduce the brome problem, do you think, much? I've got one field with two bad tram lines of brome. And apart from that, I'm happy enough with the brome. R- rye grass is my concern. Okay. Thanks for that, Tony. Just a quick, I'm just going to go through questions because we're going to run out of time very, very quickly. Um, and again, just I kind of ask guys to kind of maybe keep the replies quick. Um, question here for you, Rob. Um, are there more grass weeds in a con- conventional tillage system or a conservation tillage system? Have you seen much change in the in weed spectrum say, as, you, as you've gone through the system? Yeah, Shay, I have seen a change, no doubt about it. Um, and I suppose when you talk about just changing the system, I mean, the farmers have changed, the system has changed. There's been so much has changed. So to, to put it down to one thing is very, very difficult. So when we're talking about the conservation system, that has come with an awful lot of discussion, a lot of being exposed to other farmers, even hearing Donald and Bill speak honestly there about their own problems. All that adds to your own arsenal of, of how you attack your, pro- your problems and how you understand your own problems and you get insights. So, so I think, you know, the, the, the transition to, to the conservation has been massive personally and, and in the amount of information we have. So we're better, we're better equipped. Better equipped, yeah. Quick question here for Connor. You might tr- look at this one. All the guys have talked about organic manures and farmyard manures and all that type of thing and bringing them in on the farm. And we all know the benefits of them. Would you have any advice for guys who are bringing in our organic manures in terms of farm safety and, and, and all that type of thing? And yeah, I suppose it's good, good to know the source where your manure is coming from, that they're not bringing straw down from bringing straw in from the UK, that they're getting sourced and straw locally. And even if you, if you could come into an arrangement with a farmer that you're actually taking back in the straw that you're giving them, it's, not, it's definitely not always possible, but it is something that, that could be looked at. And um, I suppose just, just general good machinery hygiene, especially around, around um, harvest time. And just, it's a, a great time now to actually get out and walk your fields and having a look up and down tram lines and making sure that there's no strange grass weeds present in the field. And if there is, there's always someone there you can give, you can phone your agronomist, your advisor, or something, just to come in and, and maybe have a, have a look have a look at it. Yeah, good good question, a good good bit of advice there, Connor. Um, quick question here uh, again, maybe for for Donny in terms of oilseed rape. You talked about kind of crop rotation. Do you think, and you've mentioned spring oilseed rape. Do you think a mixture of a winter oilseed rape, a cover crop, and and spring oilseed rape would solve your problem? Well, I. I'm not totally off a with 
what chemicals you can treat in oilseed rape for the ryegrass. If there was good chemicals for the ryegrass, I'd be all for winter oilseed rape. I've grown spring oilseed rape before and got on pretty well with it. But you, you were making the point, only it gives you more time to put in stale seed beds. It's not the in crop chemical that you're using, it's the it's getting the exactly. getting the weed control down before then, isn't it? If you're cutting corn on the 24th of August and you want to you want to have your oilseed rape in at that stage or within a week, it's making things very tight. There's other work to be done, you don't know. Yeah. Uh Jimmy, a quick question for you in terms of um bromes and grey grasses and that how long do the seeds stay viable in the soil? Um you're looking <sighs> You're looking at a reduction of maybe 70, maybe about 80% year on year. So like every year you'll be looking about an 80% reduction in the number of seeds that will be viable in the seed bank. Now where you're coming from a very high base. So it takes a long number of years for a lot of these seeds to reduce down to a level where you have, you know, where you'd have very few coming down or where, like getting to a stage where you'd have where you've fully eradicated weed seeds from the from the soil, I think is it would be a very challenging thing to do. But I think within five years with most of these where you don't have seed return, I think that's the key thing, where you don't have seed return, you'd be looking at having levels down to where they're very manageable. Yes. Well, and another quick question. I know you've done a little bit of work on it. Um any any work on Avidex and using a sequence with other products like uh, DFF and Flufenicet? Yeah, we I suppose where I have seen Avidex here really has been in, in spring crops in the last couple of years, but the last two springs haven't lent themselves to pre-emerge because they've been so dry. Um, if you look at what they're doing in the UK, they're effectively using um, the Avidex granule in sequence with DFF and flufenicide, and it is working in a pre-emerge situation. Um, but again, look, you're looking at you're looking at stacking herbicides. It's it's a considerable cost as well. But where you do have maybe resistant grass weeds, and you're looking at winter cropping, it, it's definitely a, it's probably a it's probably a must really is pre-emerge herbicides, whatever it might be. Um, but I think the the key point here is that we shouldn't just rely on herbicides. I think everybody's made that no. point today so far on 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 this webinar that it's it's rotations, it's cultural control methods, it's all the all the tools that we need to use. Um, uh, kind of, maybe another question to you, Jimmy, then. The cap deal is talking about continuous rotations. Is this going to affect grass weed control, do you think? Yeah, oh. look, at it. <laughs> um, it's hard to, and I, I don't want to prejudge anything either, but if we're going to be limited or we're going to be forced to, start, to grow certain crops in certain situations, it's going to probably uh, complicate, it could possibly complicate the... Uh, the grass weed control strategies that were that are available to some farm, but again, you don't want to preempt anything. You'd hope common sense will prevail at the end of the day. Okay, listen, guys, I'm going to leave it at that because we're kind of well over time now at this stage. But I just want uh, to say thanks to each and every one of you, and especially to Bill Tadoni and to Rob for participating on the webinar today. You've been a, a brilliant source of information to to everybody that's been on, and likewise to the guys that were on the previous webinars as well, and indeed to all the all the farmers who are participating in the in the ECT program. I mean, without them, um, we, we couldn't go ahead with the program. So they're providing us with a huge amount of information that we can disseminate out across everybody in, in, in the industry. So I'm going to say thanks to, to you all. Thanks for participating. I'd also like to say thanks to the people who prepared the, the videos in the background, the VT in the background. Again, without them, this wouldn't have been a successful webinar. So with that, I'm going to say take our leave and say thanks to everybody and Wish everybody out there a safe and a, and a profitable harvest. And remember, safety has to be part of our, 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 our jobs when we're out farming as well in a very, very busy time over the coming months. So with that, I hope to see you all shortly sometime in the autumn. We, we do to have our crops form in September. So hopefully we'll see you all uh, at that stage then. So until then, bye for now. Thanks, everybody. Isn't that a bugger, though? No.